listening to Give God 90, where we're not afraid of the tough biblical questions, because we will dig through the language, the culture, and the history to find the truth revealed in the words of our Creator. Uh, you, here is, you know, just a warning for you today. You may want to grab your uh, life preservers or at least hold on to a personal flotation device. Uh, when we start uh, making the water rough today, some of you uh, may get a little queasy. Some of you uh, might go overboard. And if your boat is not properly adjusted, it might capsize. That's just a warning. My name is Jerry Mitchell. Sitting in her supervisor's chair is Myra. Good morning, everyone. Uh, We're (laughs) really uh, wound up today with, or I am, with this. And I think some of you might get a little riled up, too. Um, I want to start today by saying if you're new here, we thank you. If you've been listening for a while, we really appreciate you. Check out GiveGodNoney.com. See what's there. You might you might be surprised. If you like what you hear, you know, we really like it when you hit those share buttons. Don't forget uh, to turn on the notifications. That boosts everybody up in the algorithms. And you can reach out either uh, live if you're listening live or later uh, through one of the social media places where we're at. Somebody did that the other evening after they uh, heard one of our podcasts, uh, and it was it was obviously after I went to bed. <clears throat> they ha- had a question. I, I apparently wasn't as clear, maybe, as I should have been with something. Um, but it, I'm kind of glad that it happened the way it did because it actually sparked a thread of responses in that social media group that this question was asked in. And, and I encourage that kind of thing. Okay, you, as long as you keep it uh, direct and and respectful and <laughs> and all those good things, but the concepts and ideas that that people had really sparked from just a, a simple question. I, I thought it was fascinating to read the the whole list of comments because what was going on were these folks were were digging for answers. They were actually studying. They were doing things. They were seeking. They were searching. And really, isn't that what we're trying to do? Yes. You know, trying to get people to look for answers, trying to get people to hear our Creator. Don't take our word for it. Go go look for yourself. Go look for yourself. And when we began looking at Proverbs 31, uh, we started in verse 10. And without going over the whole thing, Again, <clears throat> Solomon uh, is writing about uh, how people can prepare for marriage and what the responsibilities are for both the man and the woman. And we're going to see in a few minutes that Solomon continues to outline some of the ways um, that that the parameters of the marriage uh arrangement in the covenant can be applied to their lives. And, and I, I don't want to sound like I'm bragging, but that's kind of what we're trying to do here is is to teach you how to apply some of these biblical principles in your modern day lives, give you suggestions. Uh, and that's what Solomon's doing here a lot of times. But he's also including some very, very interesting things some that you may not may have been familiar with, some you might not be familiar with. Uh, so I'm going to let Myra start this time for verse 12 and read just a couple of verses uh, past where we left off. She does him good and not harm for as long as she lives. She looks for wool and linen. She likes to work with her hands. She is like a trader's ship. She goes far to get food. She gets up while it's still dark. She prepares food for her family. She also feeds her servant girls. 
She looks at a field and buys it with money she has earned. She plants a vineyard. She does not work with energy. She, sorry. She does her work with energy. Her arms are strong. So she gets up while it's dark and prepares food for her family and servant girls. Hmm, really? Is that what Solomon actually wrote? Uh, not quite what he wrote. It's close, but it gives us some wrong impressions, some wrong ideas. What he actually wrote, uh, according to the original Hebrew uh, that we have right now, she rises while it is still night and provides food for her household and a portion for her servants. If the family is well off, and not every, not all of them were, right? You know, somebody had to be the servant. <clears throat> so keep that in mind. You know, the wife probably didn't do the cooking. However, because as we learned in a previous episode, the home is not supposed to be boring, right? One of the ways that she prevents that is she has control over the menu. Now, <laughs> there, there wasn't any of this, uh, what do you want to eat? I don't know. That just didn't happen, right? <laughs> and, and I'm guilty. You know, Myra's guilty, and I think most people are guilty of, I don't know what I want to eat from time to time. You know, it, it, it gets, I don't want to say monotonous, but it, it gets to the point where I want something a little different, but I'm not quite sure what it is, right? Now, there is a joke in the United States that when couples are looking for a place to maybe have a meal away from home, you know, well, where do you want to go? I don't know. And now there's quite a few restaurants propping up called, I don't know. <laughs> you know, makes sense. Perfect marketing scheme, right? Now think about this. If the family is not fortunate enough to have servants, the wife may actually prepare the meals. She might actually do the cooking. What happens if the wife is not a good cook? Now, that happens. <clears throat> I know... Uh, and, and I'm not going to name names here, but I know one person in particularly, or in particular, uh, in our family, uh, she can't boil water. She made chicken once, and it was okay, but she put a lot of other stuff on top of it. <laughs> she tries, but she's just not that good of a cook. What Doesn't happens? Do it enough. Well, no, she doesn't. Well, you know, and some people never learn. They they never understand how the whole cooking process works. They don't understand the, the process of using spices uh, properly. So when that happens, you know, do you think the guy's going to go hungry? No, he's going to do the cooking. He's going to prepare the meal for the family. And if there's children involved... Well, you know, he cooks for them too. He fixes their food. However, according to Solomon, the menu is controlled by the ladies. So ladies, when it comes time to think about what's for the next meal, maybe you should be a little more assertive and say something like, we're having, and you can fill in your own blank there. Right? Men, here, take, take a clue, unless it's completely inedible, eat it like it's the best thing she's ever made. Okay? <clears throat> Careful there. I'm watching your face. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you really want me to tell that story? <laughs> <laughs> good <laughs> but there was once and, and it was I think the only time in 30 years that uh, she added an ingredient that should not have been added we'll just we'll leave it at that uh, now the question 
what if a family is in servitude? What if they are the servants? Well, that would mean that whatever the head of the household that they are working for wants, that you know is what's going to be on the menu because you know, that particular wife is in charge of that household. So whatever she you know declares is the men on the menu for the day, that is it. Now that doesn't mean that men don't have an input, right? It simply means that to prevent the home from being boring, to ensure that uh, people are uh, being adequately fed, and that, that sounds a little technical, doesn't it? To make sure that everybody gets what they like, and it's not always the same thing, somebody has to take charge, right? Being indecisive is not an attribute for a strong, efficient wife who is the general of her army, her family. Doesn't mean uh, you know she can be like a one-star general and, and somebody else can be the, the five-star. But there are certain things that couples need to understand, and this is... This is important here. Even though you have crossover jobs, somebody's got to be uh, the one who would sit down and pay the bills, you know, write the bills out every week or every month. Somebody else, you know, might need to uh, to be the one who, who chooses the menu. It doesn't mean both of you can't go to the grocery store. It doesn't mean you can't share what you like. It simply means the indecisiveness, uh, the I don't know, and I'm guilty of this one too. What do you want for supper? Food. Food. (laughs) I'm guilty. Indecisiveness has no place in a strong family unit. Now, we joke about that a lot, right? Uh, You know, what do you want? I don't know. Food. Food. But when it comes down to it, we know what's here. We know what we bought. We know what's available. And it simply is prepared. Doesn't magically do it itself. Somebody has to do it. Here lately it's been me <clears throat> because we have a, a one armed bandit in our house. <laughs> 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 but hopefully. Hopefully you're thinking now, well, wait a minute. What, what about Genesis 2.18? You know, God said it's not good for man to be alone. I'll, I'll make a helper for him. Well, this help meet, as it says in King James, or helper in, in other uh, aspects, isn't a servant for the man. It's to be his equal. Somebody who has the capability of, of maintaining the family while at the same time maintaining a good reputation for the family in the community. And and this next verse might give us some insight into exactly how much women were treated equally among the community. And before we get into this, here's where I'm going to start rocking the boat, folks. Remember in 1 Kings chapter 3, Solomon uh was asked in a dream, you know, God came to him in a dream while he was at uh, Gideon, I believe is where he was, and said, you know, what he asked and I will give, right? Well, Solomon didn't ask for a long life. He didn't ask to be famous. He didn't ask for all these other things. He said, and in most English Bibles it says, I need, I want wisdom. That's not what it said. What Solomon actually asked for was a heart to shema, to hear and understand. I need a heart that will let me understand not only my people that I am king over, but I need a heart to understand what you want. And he's talking to his creator. Solomon completely understood and was granted that. So when he writes 
It's not some off-the-wall thing. He understood. He had written out his own first five books of our Bible. He had written it out in front of the priest so they knew he had it right. That was a requirement of the king. So when Solomon wrote this next phrase... She looks at a field and buys it. She looks at a field and buys it. With money she has earned, she plants a vineyard. Does that rock your boat for some of you? For the folks who were brought up, uh, for the folks who were brought up in some denominations, it may. Because, wait a minute, women were property. Fathers gave away their daughters, right? Fathers sold their children, their daughters. And now all of a sudden we're reading, she can purchase property? How does property purchase property? Uh Uh-oh. Somebody out there overboard yet? It's right here. It's right here. Now, the actual word, she considers, and that word considers means to plan carefully. She plans carefully. It's not something she jumps into. She buys a field, and here's where things, again, You've got to understand where they're coming from with her fruit. Now, what is fruit? Uh, Matthew 7, 16, you know them by their fruit, right? Fruit can mean many, many things in Scripture. It doesn't necessarily always have to be money. It doesn't always necessarily have to be uh, past actions, as you'll know them by their fruit. doesn't mean that uh, we all have to uh, have our own fruit trees of some kind that, oh, he grows wonderful pears. She has wonderful apples. That's not what it's talking about. Remember earlier it said that she seeks out uh, fine linen and sells it, right? What does she do with her money? I think it's in verse 10. It says she's supposed to be wealthy. How she acquire that wealth? How, you know, when we think about women in the Bible, we often get hung up on the uh, first century aspect of it. And, the, and, and by the time the first century rolled around, there had been enough corruption from other uh, nations that they, the Jewish folks had adopted some of those customs. All right? Now, it, it might surprise some people to learn that women a thousand years before Jesus, before Yeshua was born, women were able to, to purchase property on their own. For, you know, right here in Solomon's Proverbs, women were expected to. They were expected to do something productive with that property. Now, that doesn't mean that every woman today needs to go out and and, uh, buy a piece of land and begin a winery. That's not what it's saying, okay? That's just Solomon's giving uh, examples of applying Scripture to their lives at that time. Now, today, maybe she begins a business either from home or from outside the home. You know, today, uh, and an energetic, strong wife should be actually encouraged towards entrepreneurship. Meyer's done that with some things. You know, some worked, some didn't, but she was willing to try. You know, even before we had any idea that this is what was supposed to be happening, we were doing it for some strange reason. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Uh, part of that was out of necessity. Part of it wasn't. 
and that's okay. You know, in the in the United States, we have mistaken that women should be stay at home moms and make you know make sure supper's ready and waiting for when the man comes home from work, right? Well, the television shows of the fifties and sixties, nineteen fifties, nineteen sixties, contributed to this notion. But that's fiction. Solomon's writing about real life. There's a lot of companies today uh, that operate worldwide, and, and you know some uh, do their you know, help people either through sales or marketing. Some are called multi-level marketing things. Some uh, are in production type situations, and a lot of people take advantage of that to to do those things in their spare time to help earn money for the family. Some of these companies, though, I need to warn you, are not very reputable. So, again, care should be taken. You have to consider them. You have to research them. You have to plan. If you're thinking about doing something like that, you know, research it. Just like, um, you know, women are to consider. They're to think, not to jump into something uh, just because it sounds good. Oh, you know, so and so offered me a, a deal. Uh, he's selling me his land for, you know, a dollar. Well, that's nice. What are you going to do with it? Well, I'm going to plant such and such. Well, you can't plant anything there. It's a rock. There's no dirt on top of it. It's a it's a giant boulder. Oh, I didn't think about that. You think about those things before you buy it, not after. It says she considers the field, right? Plan carefully. Uh, You know, the original word in Hebrew can also mean to purpose, to devise. It's even been translated in some places as scheme in some translations. But what we need to remember is it's not a quick, indecisive, it's not a quick response to anything. You've got to weigh out the good, you've got to weigh out the bad, you've got to do it all. Does that mean asking people? Yeah. Does that mean, you know, today it can mean uh, getting on, on the Internet and researching companies. Right? Now, I, I don't know how many of you have ever planted a vineyard. It takes a lot of effort to plant a vineyard. Right? You know, when the plants are ready to be put in the field, originally grapes grow from seeds, right? Today we have hybrids that are actually, uh, you take grafts out. But when you start a plant from seed, it's, you don't just put a grape seed in the ground and expect to have you know, a vineyard. You have to take care of them. You have to raise them up to a certain level. And then you have to go dig a hole. When the plant's big enough, you have to go dig a hole. But the the hole needs to be bigger than the plant because underneath of that plant, you're going to put the nutrient-rich compost or or something that is going to jumpstart that plant. It takes effort. After that, once you get all that done, that grape doesn't just grow up by itself. You've got to then put some type of support system up for it, an arbor, right? That takes effort. That takes work. Isn't it, isn't it amazing how this one little, she <laughs> she considers a field and buys it to plant a vineyard verse can look like... Um, I want to start a business. I've got to prepare everything that I need for it just right. And then, uh, after the groundwork's all done, you know, my business can, can, can grow, but I need this support system. Now, today, you know, in today's world, if you're uh, maybe producing something and shipping it out, you might need a contract with UPS or FedEx or somebody to get a better deal on your shipping cost. That's your support system. 
It's more than just your customers. It's more than just the, the people who are buying your product. It's more than just the people you're talking to. If you're in a marketing thing, you know, your communications, whether it's email, text, uh, Zoom, all of that's part of the support system, and it has to be in place for your business to grow. It's a lot of work to establish a reputable, successful business, but it's worth it. And I th- hope... You know, I didn't actually capsize anybody's boats, but I probably uh, have just given you much more to think about than you've ever thought about before when it comes to that kind of a thing. She considers a field. She buys a vineyard. But let's not stop there. Let's move on to verse 17. She does her work with energy. Her arms are strong. Um, that's not me right now. That's not you right now. <laughs> it, it actually, the closest English word is she girds herself with a strong body. Huh? She strengthens her arms. It is pretty easy to understand. The gird's one of those biblical words that we don't use anymore, right? It actually... Uh, In in the late 17, early 1800s, it meant to wrap with a flexible substance. Well, let's just cut to the chase. She stays in shape. All right? She doesn't let herself get weak. Up until a couple years ago, (laughs) (laughs) that's exactly uh, what Meyer was doing. After she got hurt, it was a different story. It doesn't mean she spends hours at the gym, right? But she maintains her physical strength. Her arms are strong. Now, now this is something I get to see many times a day. Um, After my shoulder surgery, just over a month ago now, right? Uh, She needs to keep her shoulder from freezing or locking up. So a few times every day, she uses her uh, shoulder pulley. And, and I'm going to be honest here. I thought there might actually be some fancy scientific name for that thing, but uh, it really is just a pulley, a shoulder pulley. <laughs> that's what they call it. That that's as scientific as it gets. Anyway, she sits or sits or stands, and and she raises her arm without using the muscles. And and while the muscles are healing, the joints need to be need to remain flexible. Because if you don't use your shoulder, it freezes, it up. freezes up. It's called frozen shoulder. Now, before she was hurt, she had, you know, she was strong. She, woman pull plow. Well, not quite, but she was full of dynamite, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> I could lift patients. <laughs> you, yeah. You know, I, I, I've watched her drive a six-horse team when I was feeding hay to, her, to the cattle in Colorado. She was picking up uh, her grandchildren. She was helping in the garden. You know, she was doing CPR at the hospital. All of those things build muscles, rolling patients around, rolling them over. You know, I, I joke about her being a little fragile now, but I have a feeling uh, about a year from now she won't be as fragile because it takes about a year for a shoulder to heal. And this isn't about being able to pull a plow. It's about being a strong woman, being able to manage a household. It's about the marriage covenant, where each person does everything they're able to do to ensure the family remains intact and reputable. A family that's considered of good character in the community. A family that puts the desires of the Creator above everything else. I I know that uh, in the United States today, there are at least, uh, well, there, there are a lot of people who probably think, that children get into trouble because there's no father in the home for whatever reason, either through death, divorce, or maybe he really is just a deadbeat dad, right? But the mother contributes to troubled children as well. When the mother's not strong or the mother fails to teach the children and guide them in the way the Creator desires, the child's going to learn from that as well. 
we, we can't expect a child to automatically live the way they're designed to live unless they're guided into it. And, and I certainly uh, can attest to that. It, it, it took a very long time for me to learn these things. And as much as my parents tried, as they didn't know. They didn't know that these th- the things that they were supposed to be teaching me. Um, you can't teach what you don't know. Myers parents are the same way. As as much as <laughs> as much as they wanted her to have that perfect perfect uh, you know nineteen fifties wife life, you know, kind of like Harriet uh, Harriet Nelson, right? Wasn't it Ozzy and Harriet? Yeah, Harriet Nelson had. It, that's not the life she wound up with. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. <laughs> And and that's because real life isn't some fictional TV show. Life is tough. And in this fallen world that we live in, you know, it's more important to learn the lessons we have access to in the Bible. If we learn these lessons and apply them to our life, well, it makes life easier doesn't make it perfect doesn't make it uh you know it's not going to be always a cakewalk but it helps and that's why we keep doing what we're doing we try to uh give you ideas give you ways give you some instruction and a way that you can apply the things we read in the bible to your life today Do you have anything you want to add to all of that? Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you Thursday. And plan those meals, women. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> that that really is a joke in our house right now because <laughs> she's not able to do the cooking and I, I get supervised sometimes. Are you sure you really want to do that like that? <laughs> but anyway. But he's covering my, you know, I put 100, he puts 100. Right now I'm putting like 40, maybe 35, and he's doing the 170%. <laughs> 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 uh, somebody's got to. Anyway, until Thursday, we wish you many, many blessings, everyone. <laughs>